Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the Law Center's newest report, From Wrongs to Rights, The Case for Homeless Bill of Rights Legislation. My name is Tristia Bauman. I'm the Housing Program Director and Senior Counsel at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Also today, you'll be hearing from Professor Sarah Rankin of Seattle University School of Law, who is also a co-author on the report and from Paul Bowden, Executive and Organizing Director at Western Regional Advocacy Project, or RAP, located in California. Uh, throughout the course of this webinar, there will be some quick and easy poll questions that will pop up on your screen. Your answers will help give us a sense of you as audience members and also help us to better serve you in future webinars. We thank you in advance. We appreciate your participation in answering those questions. Also, please feel free to submit your own questions to us via the GoToWebinar software at any time during the course of our presentations. After the conclusion of the presentations, we will be answering questions, and questions that we are unable to get to will be answered in writing and posted on the Law Center's website, available at www.nlchp.org. First about the Law Center. The Law Center is the only national legal organization providing high-level comprehensive legal and legislative expertise resolving national homelessness issues through advocacy, advocacy training, public education, and impact litigation. As part of our work, we have authored and released a report entitled From Wrongs to Rights, the Case for Homeless Bill of Rights Legislation that discusses some common rights violations experienced by homeless Americans describes Homeless Bill of Rights enacted and proposed in several states across the country, and provides advocates with guidance for pursuing similar legislation in their states. First, what is a Homeless Bill of Rights? Well, in essence, it's a powerful legal tool that can protect the civil and human rights of homeless people. In an era of rising homelessness and widespread discrimination against homeless people, the need for positive solutions is critical. Homeless Bill of Rights are a powerful legal tool, rapidly gaining momentum across the nation, that can help protect the rights of homeless people, prevent common forms of discrimination, and lay a legal foundation for ending homelessness, all with a single piece of legislation. It also can help homeless people realize the rights that many of us take for granted. Many of us take for granted, for example, the right to move freely in public, the right to use public parks or public transportation, or the right to a reasonable expectation of privacy in our personal belongings. For many homeless people, though, these rights remain elusive. Homelessness can mark someone for police harassment, subject someone to arrest for something as harmless as merely sitting down in a public place, and cause their belongings, including photo identification or perhaps needed medication, to be treated as trash. Additional remedies for these rights violations, such as litigation under a constitutional claim, have been challenging and have not proven adequate as yet to prevent or correct such civil rights abuses. Homeless bills of rights can protect homeless people from these common forms of discrimination by enunciating the rights of homeless people in state or local law, prescribing punishment for violations of these rights, and granting increased access to justice for homeless people whose rights have been violated. Moreover, it can help lay a legal foundation to end homelessness. In addition to safeguarding existing civil rights, a homeless bill of rights offers the opportunity to secure powerful new rights necessary to permanently end homelessness, such as a right to housing. Also, homeless bills of rights can be an invaluable step toward combating the stigma of homelessness. These laws and the process of enacting them help to draw attention to the plight of our nation's homeless population. They confront the foundation of prejudice upon which discrimination against homeless people is based. They are an important step toward the development of a new rights consciousness in American society where all people are valued equally, regardless of whether they are homeless or housed. And we've seen that these laws can be enacted at both the state and local level. They're more common at the state level at this time, but they've also been proposed or enacted in municipal um, governments as well. And Madison, Wisconsin provides one example. So why are homeless bills of rights needed? Well, homelessness remains an ongoing national crisis, and by some indications, the problem is growing. 
the recent point in time count data from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, indicated that just over 600,000 people were homeless on a given night in January 2013. This statistic fails to include millions of Americans experiencing or at risk of homelessness, including people living doubled up with friends or family, people living temporarily in motels, and people in hospitals or jails with nowhere to go upon release. There are other official measures of homelessness that show the numbers reported by HUD are uh, considerably low and that, in fact, the problem is bigger. For example, the U.S. Department of Education reported that our nation's public schools served over 1.1 million homeless children in the 2011-2012 academic year, the highest number ever on record. Based on this and other research, the Law Center estimates that 3.5 million Americans experience homelessness each year. There are fewer shelter beds than actual homeless people in every major American city. The gap between sheltered space and the number of people who need shelter can number in the hundreds or thousands. Data from the San Francisco Continuum of Care, for example, shows that there are over 4,000 homeless people that are unable to secure affordable housing or shelter space, leaving them forced to perform all of their necessary life-sustaining activities in public places. This lack of supply to meet the demand leaves many homeless people with no option but to sleep, bathe, eat, and store their belongings in public spaces. Despite this reality, many cities have chosen to misuse their police power to remove visibly homeless people from sight or in some cases to force them out of entire communities. In a growing number of American cities, homeless people who have no option but to perform their necessary activities in public spaces are subject to arrest under laws that treat these natural human activities, such as sitting down or falling asleep, as criminal acts. These laws often violate homeless persons' constitutional rights, and they have also been condemned as cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment by the UN Human Rights Council Committee. In addition, these laws do nothing to solve the underlying causes of homelessness, such as the lack of affordable and available housing, and serve only to increase barriers to escaping from homelessness, all at taxpayer expense. Criminalization measures are the most egregious form of discrimination, but they're not the only form of discrimination that homeless people confront every day. A lack of an address can make it difficult for homeless people to access needed public services. It can cause someone to be passed over for employment. It can negatively impact a homeless person's ability to exercise her due process rights following an arrest. It can prevent someone from accessing needed health care. The list, unfortunately, goes on and on. Traditional remedies have been largely inadequate to prevent and remedy these rights abuses. Homeless people are not yet recognized nationwide as a protected class entitled to heightened judicial scrutiny when their rights are violated. As a result, courts may uphold discriminatory laws, such as ordinances that criminalize homelessness, if the government can merely show that the anti-homeless laws are rationally related to a legitimate governmental interest. This, combined with the expense and time investment of litigation, often leaves homeless people whose rights have been violated without any practical remedy. A homeless bill of rights by making the rights of homeless people explicit in statutory law and setting forth a mechanism for enforcing those rights can deter would-be violators from illegal actions against homeless people. And it can also provide access to justice for homeless people who may otherwise have had no recourse. For some of these reasons, homeless bills of rights have been gaining in popularity and momentum across the country. They have already been enacted in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Illinois, and the United States Territory of Puerto Rico. Such legislation has also been proposed or considered in several additional states, including California, Hawaii, Oregon, Vermont, Missouri, Massachusetts, Tennessee, and Maryland. So what can a homeless bill of rights include? Well, that really is going to vary according to the specific needs of the individual jurisdiction, usually the state. But there are seven, several common provisions. One is the right to move freely in public spaces. 
also the right to equal treatment by state and municipal authorities, the right to freedom from discrimination when seeking or maintaining employment, the right to emergency medical care, the right to vote, register to vote, and receive documentation necessary for voter registration, the right to protection from disclosure of information or records conveyed to a temporary residence like a shelter, and the right to reasonable expectation of privacy in personal property. At this time, we're going to pause very briefly for our first survey question. And if you could all just take a moment to fill that out, we appreciate it. I'll just give you guys a few seconds here to answer that. Great. And as I said before, the Homeless Bill of Rights should reflect the unique needs of homeless people in any given state, so they will vary in scope and focus. And our co-presenter and co-author of the report, Sarah Rankin, will speak more uh, in her presentation about some of the models that have emerged and discuss some strategic choices that advocates should make when designing or supporting laws in their states. So how can advocates help enact homeless bills of rights? The report provides a more detailed discussion of some of these tips that have been learned from advocates who have been successful in their states in either uh, enacting or proposing homeless bill of rights legislation. And we're going to address a few of them briefly, briefly here. The first is to gather information from homeless people when determining homeless bill of rights priorities. At its core, a homeless bill of rights must reflect the priorities and needs of homeless individuals. The first step towards building support for these laws should be gathering information from homeless people and homeless service providers to determine the most pressing needs of the community. Next, you'll want to develop a plan for building a broad coalition of support for the bill, including legislators, community groups, law enforcement, members of the legal community, and members of the media. Building support for a homeless bill of rights involves identifying and engaging a broad coalition of strategic partners. Collaboration between a variety of stakeholders is critical. It is important even to engage groups that may oppose the homeless bill of rights. Early conversations with these groups can provide much needed time to address concerns about the bill, potentially negotiate controversial provisions, and reduce opposition to the bill down the line. Passing a Homeless Bill of Rights fundamentally, of course, relies upon support from legislators who will sponsor and champion the bill, and it is also essential to build su support in the community. Service providers, community organizations, public health providers, policy experts, religious organizations, law enforcement, public defenders, and other members of the legal community can all be valuable allies. A broad coalition of community partners not only provides a strong base of support for the bill, but, as I said, it can also help to reduce any opposition that would be confronted later in the process. You'll also, of course, want to develop an education and outreach strategy to demonstrate the need for the bill and to combat stigma against homeless people. The media is going to play a crucial role in educating the community about homeless issues, so developing a media strategy is critical. Moreover, developing strong allies in the media can help prevent misinformation and biased messaging that may turn popular opinion against the bill. In addition, you'll want to develop a legislative strategy that includes a plan for identifying and negotiating potentially controversial provisions. Sarah will discuss this more in her presentation. Uh, strategies for what to include or not to include, but I'll address it briefly here. Advocates will face many choices when determining what to include in a bill. Do we ask for our entire wish list of provisions and rights? Do we avoid controversial provisions? Do we ask for something narrow, likely to pass, that we can then use to gain incremental progress over time? These are all questions that must be answered by individual communities. And there are several considerations that factor into that decision, and I'll address just a couple of them. One important substantive consideration is the relationship between rights and funding. 
the inclusion of positive rights in a bill, such as the right to housing, can be important because of its potential for significant impact. Because positive rights require government action, however, such provisions may be perceived as overly costly. Advocates can respond to such criticism with cost-benefit analyses that show investments in housing homeless people is effective and considerably less expensive than discriminatory policies such as jailing homeless people for harmless activities. Recently, the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, completed a study showing that their Housing First program has not only kept people in homes, but it saved the city over $600,000 in criminal justice and medical expenses. And that is one of a number of studies showing the same results. It is also important to note that potentially controversial provisions should not be avoided merely because they are controversial. Including these provisions can be valuable because they can inspire needed dialogue about solutions to ending homelessness. Including a right to housing in a proposed bill, for example, can be daunting because it's controversial. But advocates should be aware of some tools at their disposal. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has endorsed the local implementation of human rights treaties, including ones relevant to the criminalization of homelessness. And the American Bar Association, or the ABA, has passed a resolution calling for implementation of the human right to housing. Advocates can creatively use these resolutions in, for example, bringing a mayor on board in support of a homeless bill of rights approach or in calling for a legislator to follow the principles of the ABA. Other tips include consulting legislative and legal experts when drafting the bill to maximize the bill's chances for enactment and withstand any potential legal challenges, and also, and this is critical, to develop an implementation and enforcement plan to ensure that an enacted law ultimately has a positive impact on the lives of homeless people and is not merely words on paper. And that warrants some discussion of implementation. The first law passed in the continental United States was passed in Rhode Island in June 2012. And given the young age of the law, we are not aware of any cases that have been brought under the existing Homeless Bill of Rights in that state or in other states. But implementation can involve multiple steps and take many forms. And the Rhode Island example is instructive. One of the things that advocates have done since the passage of Rhode Island's Homeless Bill of Rights is to engage in public outreach and education campaigns related to the law. They have created Know Your Rights materials and disseminated them widely across the state. This kind of awareness building is, of course, a critical first step in implementing a law. The law is effective when people know about it and behave in accordance with it. Conversations with advocates in Rhode Island uh, provide some anecdotal evidence of changes in discriminatory practices as well. Would-be violators of the law aware that they are being watched and aware that they are now subject to potential legal penalties for violating homeless persons' rights are incentivized to change bad practices. One offered example was that of bus drivers who no longer fail to stop for people who are or appear to be homeless. Also, there's evidence which suggests that homeless people are now more comfortable and more active in advocating for themselves, advocating for their rights. Aware of their rights under the new law, homeless people are more willing to raise questions. Was that allowed? Can they do that to me? When they encounter discrimination. Enforcement mechanisms, however, are uh, arguably the most important. Arguably, we have yet to see the most significant impact of homeless bills of rights, the enforcement of rights through the courts. Enforcement mechanisms written into the law, therefore, are of the utmost importance, and ideally any homeless bill of rights should include a clear enforcement mechanism. There are really two approaches to homeless bill of rights enforcement, a judicial and administrative approach. Preferably, the law would include both measures, uh, but each have their own benefits and drawbacks. For example, a judicially enforceable Bill of Rights is designed to provide legal relief through the courts when rights are violated. Rhode Island's Homeless Bill of Rights allows for punitive damages, awards of money, appropriate injunctive and declaratory relief, which means stopping a violator from doing something or requiring a violator to do something, and reasonable attorney's fees to successful plaintiffs. 
Some advocates feel that judicial enforcement is the strongest form of enforcement, but judicial enforcement can pose challenges. It can be expensive, time-consuming, or intimidating. Administrative enforcement provisions, by requiring state agencies to take specific actions to implement and enforce the law, can help to ensure the provision of the resources and services necessary to implement and enforce the Homeless Bill of Rights. An administrative enforcement structure must be designed properly, minimizing conflicts of interest, for example, or a law will not be successful at achieving the aim of the bill. With either approach, it is important to consider the local political environment and the availability of legal services to people experiencing homelessness. As one advocate interviewed for the report said, either way, you have to think, who's the watchdog? Who's going to make sure that the agency does what it's supposed to do, or that lawsuits that need to be brought are brought? And with that, I will turn it over to co-presenter Sarah Rankin, who will talk more about the various models that have emerged uh, as part of this civil rights development, and also discuss some considerations that advocates should consider, particularly around implementation and enforcement. Thank you, Tristia. Uh, my name is Sarah Rankin, and I teach at the Seattle University School of Law, where my work often focuses on legal issues affecting homeless Americans. And I've been very fortunate to work closely with the National Law Center, the National Coalition for the Homeless, and other really terrific advocacy groups uh, across the nation. So over the course of the next 15 minutes, I am going to quickly highlight some points that I discuss in greater detail in my article entitled, A Homeless Bill of Rights Revolution. The article is available through links cited in the National Law Center report and also through the link on this PowerPoint slide. Uh, a Homeless Bill of Rights Revolution surveys current efforts to enact homeless bills of rights in nine states and the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. It details the history and content of these bills and draws substantive and strategic comparisons among them. It also analyzes the potential challenges and be benefits of this new legislative tool, both from a practical and a theoretical perspective. In terms of substantive provisions, what I really mean is what are the substantive provisions that a particular advocate desires in a homeless bill of rights? And it can be helpful to think of substantive provisions as reflecting rights that come in one of two categories, either positive rights or negative rights. Uh, positive rights can be most simply described as those that obligate a government to provide a new service. And generally these are perceived as entailing a financial cost, so they can be more controversial and more difficult to pass. But positive rights often also reflect advocates' top priorities. And examples of positive rights that are often priorities to champions of these new bills are things like uh, uh, the right to affordable housing or shelter, uh, health care, food, uh, and workforce training. In contrast, negative rights generally do not obligate the government to provide a new service, but instead uh, they obligate the government to respect certain freedoms, to refrain from violating certain rights. And common examples of negative rights include the right to be free from discrimination in employment, uh, in education, or in pursuit of housing. Uh, and also the right to be free from violations of one's general constitutional rights, such as a reasonable right to privacy and property. Now, um, often when debates about negative rights occur, it's not because of cost as it might be with positive rights. Instead, the debates over negative rights often relate to the perceived value of reiterating rights for homeless Americans that, in a perfect world, should really be equally enjoyed and realized by everyone. Um, of course, we know in practice these rights are not equitably realized, especially for many homeless people. So when negative rights are combined with some meaningful enforcement mechanism, such as judicial enforceability, um, many advocates believe that negative rights provisions add uh, strong teeth to the advancement of homeless rights. Uh, my article discusses some of the problems with overestimating or overvaluing judicial enforceability uh, however, um, even judicially enforceable negative rights 
can have a critical impact on social awareness, social norms, and rights consciousness. Uh, as I mentioned, because negative rights essentially articulate rights that presumably should already exist for everyone, they tend to be generally less controversial and easier to pass. That is, except for the, the doozy, uh, and that is uh, anti-criminalization provisions. Um, a review of case studies show there is some varied success uh, across jurisdictions um, as to you know, whether these provisions have been enacted. Uh, and when they are enacted, there are some important variations in wording and in how specifically advocates have been able to um, address or confront criminalization ordinances and practices in these bills. But all of these substantive um, considerations, and of course many others, um, will influence an advocate's approach to a homeless bill of rights. In terms of strategic considerations, these, of course, will be colored by uh, each jurisdiction's reality, such as the political uh, climate in your jurisdiction. But it can be helpful to think of strategic considerations from three perspectives. The first is the advocate's end goal for the particular legislative session. Is your goal to get a homeless bill of rights enacted within a particular legislative session? Uh, for some advocates, the top priority is to get uh, even a modest version of the bill enacted because those advocates view uh, that accomplishment as a really important toehold. For other advocates, the top priority is to advance and push public debate and dialogue about priority uh, homeless rights issues, even if those priorities are unlikely to be enacted. In other words, uh, pushing the public discussion and awareness is a primary goal in and of itself, even if the focus of the discussion is not within the scope of the bill that stands a strong chance of being enacted, at least in that legislative session. Very closely related to the end goal is an advocate's view of incremental progress. And the inquiry here is really, what would you consider sufficient progress from the status quo to make your investment in a homeless bill of rights worthwhile? Does it depend on the enactment of the ideal legislation? Uh, can progress to you be measured by the enactment of any legislation as a, as a sort of toehold? Or uh, can progress be measured from the achievement of a short-term versus a long-term goal? A third strategic consideration is how to frame the originally proposed bill. So how ambitious should your starting bill be? How much room should an advocate leave for negotiation? Uh, now sometimes this strategy is constrained by the length of the legislative session, so jurisdic jurisdictions with longer legislative sessions uh, might be able to afford a more aggressive or ambitious starting point than a jurisdiction with a relatively shorter legislative session. But ultimately, uh, all of these strategic considerations, and certainly others, uh, can influence your approach to a homeless bill of rights. Oops. Let's see, how do I go back? There we go. Um, there are a range of models, and Tristia went through, uh, uh, went through a bunch of them. And so although several jurisdictions have enacted, uh, proposed, or are considering homeless bills of rights, um, we've determined that there are three case studies that we think are particularly helpful to demonstrate these variations in substantive and strategic considerations. And they are Puerto Rico, uh, Rhode Island, and then uh, California's bill. Puerto Rico is, a, in my view, a fascinating example for a variety of reasons. Um, perhaps some of its uniqueness could be attributed to a mainland versus an island perspective. Um, I think there's still, it still remains to be seen how much cultural and demographic factors might play into the formation of this legislation. Uh, and this is a really interesting question uh, to me, especially given some of the recent developments in Hawaii, uh, another island jurisdiction. Um, Puerto Rico actually has the longest history uh, with homeless bills of rights. Since 1998, Puerto Rico has enacted a series of uh, several pieces of homeless rights legislation. And these laws 
uh, enumerate several positive and negative rights. Uh, the, anything from the right to shelter, uh, the right to nourishment, medical attention, workforce training, protection from law enforcement officers specifically against any kind of mistreatment, and free access to and use of parks, town squares, and other public facilities. Puerto Rico, um, I think, is, is very unique in terms of its strategic hallmarks because of its view um, towards its unique vision of, of, of implementation. The legislation itself details an administrative plan for the implementation and enforcement of these laws. Uh, and as I mentioned, I, I think it's really visionary in many respects. The primary challenge in Puerto Rico has been a conflict of interest problem. And that's because the design, implementation, and enforcement of these laws are all currently vested in a single administrative agency. And many Puerto Rico advocates that I've spoken to believe that this conflict of interest has compromised the effectiveness of the legislation. Uh, nonetheless, Puerto Rico's model shows promise, especially as the only model so far, uh, certainly that I'm aware of, that explicitly addresses implementation and enforcement from an administrative standpoint instead of from a purely judicial standpoint. Rhode Island, uh, as Tristia mentioned, became the first mainland state to pass a homeless bill of rights in June of 2012. And as such, it has quickly become a model for many other mainland US advocates that are considering similar legislation. Illinois and Connecticut have already passed homeless bills of rights based on the Rhode Island template. Hawaii, Vermont, Missouri, and Massachusetts are just some of a handful uh, that are also basing their bills on Rhode Island's model but have, as of yet, to enact such a law. Um, Rhode Island's homeless bill of rights was passed as an amendment to the state's Fair Housing Practices Act and it specifically incorporates the state's constitutional equal protection provisions. The statute also, the statute also enumerates uh, seven negative rights for homeless Rhode Islanders, including but not limited to uh, the right to use and move freely in public spaces, the right to equal treatment from all state and municipal agencies, uh, the right to be free from employment discrimination based on housing status, and certain constitutional rights to privacy and property. The law does not grant homeless Rhode Islanders any new or special rights. Uh, indeed, the law itself expressly provides that these rights are, quote, the same rights and privileges as any other resident, unquote, of Rhode Island. Uh, and however, these rights are judicially enforceable. There are specific provisions in Rhode Island's law that says that aggrieved plaintiffs can seek injunctive and declaratory relief, actual damages, and reasonable attorney's fees and costs if their rights are violated under the new law. In terms of strategic hallmarks, Rhode Island advocates uh, that we spoke to really valued getting uh, a homeless bill of rights enacted sooner than later. And they really accomplished a tremendous amount despite a relatively shorter legislative session. Um, moreover, it was clear that Rhode Island advocates uh, intend to monitor the legislation. They're going to watch and see what happens and look for evidence of what's working and what's not. And uh, they aim to refine the law in future legislative sessions. California uh, is the last case study I'll mention, and I'm not going to say too much about it because we're so fortunate to have Paul Bowden, uh, who will be the next speaker, and he is a major force behind California and Oregon's efforts here. Uh, but I will say in brief, California proposed uh, a bill last session. Uh, it had actually some very promising progress and ultimately died. As Paul will tell you in no uncertain terms, the advocates are regrouping uh, and are far from exhausted. The substantive provisions of California's bill, uh, it, had, it had many negative rights that are similar to those that were passed in Rhode Island. But it, it critically, it also included some of the advocates' priorities that were uh, initially envisioned but were ultimately cut from Rhode Island's bill, such as uh, the right to adequate housing and shelter, 
access to legal counsel, equal treatment from law enforcement specifically, and uh, other specific anti-criminalization provisions. Uh, similar to Rhode Island, the California bill contemplates judicial remedies for aggrieved plaintiffs whose rights are violated under the law. In terms of strategic hallmarks, uh, California's advocates really um, wanted to get their substantive priorities on the table, especially anti-criminalization provisions. So they stuck to their guns on those provisions, uh, and they focused on the advancement of public awareness. Um, and they aim to come back, as Paul will tell you, in the next legislative session with these anti-criminalization provisions at the centerpiece. So in closing, I will say advocates who are interested in homeless bills of rights, of course, will need to consider both uh, substantive and strategic goals. Um, and these goals and the particularities of your own jurisdiction, of course, will help uh, to shape your legislative advocacy plan. I will say I am aware uh, of law faculty and law students who would like to help advocates who are interested in working on these types of bills. If that's an invitation that's interesting to you, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help you get in touch. Um, going forward, I'd personally like to see an increasing focus in these bills on implementation and enforcement. Um, judicial enforceability is certainly a positive thing, but as I articulate in my article, we can go beyond that. There are really appropriate roles for advocates in the implementation and enforcement process that can help to ensure the realization of homeless rights. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Paul Burden. Hi, and thank you. So there we go. And I am Paul Bowden. I uh, was homeless in New York for a while and then came up through San Francisco's homeless program in 1983. And I've been working on homelessness issues both primarily in the West Coast but nationally um, since that time, about 31 years. And this Homeless Bill of Rights campaign is really an uh, end result of a bunch of organizations working for a long time and battling with this issue uh, ever since. So this is, we have a campaign that we are running in and it's right now it is focused overwhelmingly as an organizing campaign. Um, it, we feel that from learning from last year in California that the kind of change that we're all looking for out here isn't going to happen by the through the benevolence of some freaking politician or some city council that we have to organize and build power in order to be treated with dignity and respect. And so this image that you see in front of you and the quote from Martin Luther King um, exemplify what it is that we're focusing on in our Homeless Bill of Rights campaign. This image was created by a gentleman named Ronnie Goodman, a homeless individual um, that worked with the organizers that make up RAP as an organization. Um, and this is a list of those core members, the core, the core groups that we work with. We work with artists to create images that then go out into all of our communities and speak to our issues. And the process of creating the artwork is one that involves the organizing that we're doing. Each of these members, these are our core member groups. These are the groups that we work for and, and are held accountable by. And each of them holds themselves accountable through street outreach and shelter outreach and program outreach as well as community forums so that any time RAP members, any RAP member anywhere says this is what we think, this is who we are, that has gone through an extensive process of accountability in order to use the word we. As part of that process, we continue to do street outreach um, and we continue to engage the communities and as you see in this image, do direct actions and get out in the streets and play music and dance in our demonstrations and, and it, use this as an opportunity to show our power, to show our creativity, to show our intelligence and our research and highlight that we are not homeless people, 
We are people that are without housing, and we are vital members of any community, and we have therefore every freaking right in the world to be treated with the dignity and respect that we deserve. These six issues highlighted here on this slide, that is the core of our campaign. Those six issues are all priorities for us in the work that we are doing and in the bills that we are creating. And we cannot compromise on these six issues without an extensive process of going back to our community and saying, well, this wasn't politically feasible or this was objected to by a politician in order to get his vote, we might have to compromise on that. We, we as the representatives of our community, have no ability, no right, and, and no justification to make that kind of a compromise without that order coming directly from the community of people that we represent. The reason we feel so strongly about it and why this is so important to us is because of the 13, almost 1,300, and this will be getting updated um, in very shortly, but so far, 1,276 direct contacts with individuals, one-on-one, -on -one, highlighting what it is that is happening with them in terms of the business improvement district, private security assholes, and the police, and what it is that they are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And you see here very clearly, 81% of the people that we talk to have been messed with for sleeping, 78% for sitting or laying down on a sidewalk, 66% for what they call loitering, we call standing still. That is unconscionable. That is what is now being considered criminal activity, sleeping, sitting, and standing still. That is unacceptable. And that it, the fact that these are in 12 different cities <coughs> and the results are identical across the board in all of the places that we where we've gone and talked to people, and the fact that so many of them are having the same exact experience regardless of where they are, to us is a social justice issue. This is about we need a new social justice campaign or a reinvigorated social, not a new, a reinvigorated social justice campaign that happens to come from the homeless community but is not exclusive to the homeless community because these sitting on the sidewalk and loitering happens to day laborers. It happens to young kids of color that are living outside of the where their homes used to be that were destroyed through Hope 6 or through mortgaging off public housing. This is people that, that hang out on the sidewalk that live in single room occupancy hotels. They're all, all of us are getting hassled and getting cited and getting arrested for the mere fact that we exist. And if you can't sleep, you can't sit, and you can't stand still, all you're left with being able to do is walk. In other words, get the hell out of town. When we then ask, do you know of a safe legal place for you to sleep while you're homeless, the 74% said absolutely not. And that means safe from the police, safe from getting lit on fire, getting kicked, getting beaten up. 74% of the thir almost 1,300 people we talked to had no idea of a safe place where they could lay their heads at night. That's vital that that comes out, that that be spoken to. And the reason it's vital is because when we did the historical analysis, we looked at Jim Crow, we looked at Antioche, we looked at ugly laws, we looked at Operation Wetback. This country has a repetitive history. I guess that's redundant. This, this country, time and time again, comes up with different ways in which local governments have enacted in which to get rid of the people that they've decided they want to get rid of. And today, it's homeless people. Tomorrow, it could be the next group of people. Who knows who it's going to be tomorrow? But we sure as hell know that in the past, it's been disabled people. It's been African Americans. It's been homeless people before. It's been Japanese Americans. It's been <coughs> people from Mexico that were brought in to fill jobs and then were chased out of the country once they were deemed no longer needed. This is a re repetition, and what, while we think that Antioche laws are a thing of the past and only in the Grapes of Wrath movie or wherever, the, wherever we happen to see the shit, you know, the ugly laws are a thing of the past, today's laws are identical in how they're created, how they're implemented, and how they're enforced. It's just a different target population, so today it's called quality of life or nuisance crimes. 
Lord knows mentally ill people. There's more mentally ill people in our local jails for nuisance crimes than there are mentally ill people in our health care system. You know, that's unacceptable. And we need to develop a movement, develop a campaign that is going to say, the hell with this shit. We're not taking it anymore. You've done it before. We're taking away your ability to pass these laws and to criminalize our presence. And you know what we have noticed in, from 31 years of working in homeless programs, what we have clearly seen is they'll have forums, they'll have local homeless coordinating boards, they'll have coordinating bodies, they'll write 10-year plans, or, and now the 10-year plans are 12 years old, so Portland's calling it reset. Reset what? We're not resetting the restoration of affordable housing funding. In fact, we're still cutting our housing funding. And we see more and more plans, more and more initiatives, chronic homeless initiative, HUD veteran uh, partnerships so that we house 100 vets in Salt Lake City, Utah, and say that we've ended homelessness in the whole state. You know, we don't want another plan. We don't want another coordinating body. We want our civil rights, and we want our right to exist in our local communities. And so in order to do that, we want to do this with music, we want to do it with dance, we want to do it with building power. We are not playing victim anymore. We are demanding to be treated with dignity and respect, and we only can do that in a nonviolent way where we are showing dignity and respect to each other and to our communities and to the, the representatives that we get to work on our bills and work on our campaigns. Um, and we have found this to be a really exciting way for people to plug in and a really exciting way to show power. The use of artwork is an incredibly important tool in this process, and just as is making sure that, you know, even if you know you're going to get your ass kicked, you, it's worth it to have the fight. It's worth it to not go down meekly and quietly and say, well, you know, you have no money for housing, so therefore I understand. I'll try to hide, and I'll try to be out of the way, and I'll try to make sure that you don't see me as if I'm not worthy of being seen in public spaces. You know? and, and the fact that anti-food programs is becoming the big target right now. You know? And before that, we heard it was panhandling. We've seen all of our parks get closed at night. We've seen business improvement districts take over whole sections of the city that we used to call neighborhoods that are now called business improvement districts, and then privatize the policing with, with, with security ambassadors, as they call them, in order to remove our presence. And the key point here isn't this is homeless people. It's any, any members of our community where local government uses the awesome power of the police and the judicial system and the jails in order to say, we don't want to see you. Your presence is now deemed a nuisance. And you need to either get the hell out of town Get on a bus, because even today, the easiest thing to get if you're homeless and poor is a one-way bus ticket wherever the hell it is you want to go. So either get out of town or I'm putting your ass in jail. And, and that's where this historical analysis, this historical connection to, oh, wait, haven't we seen this picture before? Haven't we seen this activity before? And nobody looks back at Jim Crow or Antiochi with pride and says, boy, I wish, uh, maybe they do, they won't say it publicly, that I wish we were still like that today. Those are the good old days when we could just chase people out of town because they're from Oklahoma or chase people out of our community because they're African American or keep them away from our water fountains. You know, we see images of parks there. You had to have a card in order to get an, an ID in order to get into a park. You know, how is that different from fencing off our parks today in order to keep homeless people out of there? And in, in order to say to somebody, you're houseless, therefore you're not worthy. Um, and then we list out, I'm trying to go quick so we have time left for a Q&A. Um, but one thing that, we, that I want to highlight here is this was just recently on Martin Luther King weekend <coughs> where 50, 17 organizations did events in all of these cities connected to each other, all talking about the Bill of Rights campaign. We um, have 85 organizations that are, are actively engaged in this campaign. 
We're currently drafting model legislation that will apply to both California and Oregon, and we'll share it with any other group that wants to look at it. Um, our only caveat is that you know, for any support that we're able to provide or for any information that we're able to provide, we ask that the focus be on creating a social justice movement um, and, and not giving up on the fact that we have to stop the criminalization because we're criminalizing human beings merely for the fact that they are in public space and merely for the fact that they exist. And so we feel like it's not enough to just say, well, the rich as well as the poor can't sleep under bridges, so everything's fair. If people are houseless because of government neglect when it comes to funding affordable housing, and if you look at our Without Housing report, you'll clearly see that people are houseless because of government neglect. Uh, $54 billion a year between 1980 and 1979 uh, and 82. 54 billion a year gets cut in 83. We're opening shelters across the country. 2004, 2014, we haven't replaced that housing funding, and yet we're arresting and criminalizing those people that ended up homeless because of the fact that we cut that funding in the first place. That's that's unacceptable, and and this campaign needs to focus on house keys, not handcuffs. That's our mantra and the key phrase that we use in, in all of our messaging around this campaign, that when we had the funding for affordable housing, we didn't have millions of people living out in the street. We didn't have the housing and urban development changing the way it counts how many when a family is homeless in order to bring down the numbers of homeless families. Meanwhile, 1.2 million children go to school every day that don't have a home to go to that night. I don't care how HUD wants to count that. That's unacceptable. These are, these are children, these are human beings, and, and the right to housing should be a, a paramount in talking about this issue. And you know, at one point in 1937, government said that it had the responsibility to ensure housing that was decent and affordable for all of its citizens. 1998, we do the contract on America with Gingrich and Clinton and they remove that language and change it to <coughs> government cannot be held accountable to ensure that all of its citizens or even a majority of its citizens have access to housing. We got to call that for what it is. That's government stepping away from a responsibility that it once assumed and then putting people out in the street by doing that and now throwing those people in jail because of the fact that they're homeless and out in our streets. We feel like this is unacceptable, and the movement is growing, and the energy is positive, and we know that we can fight back because we're starting to see it now that this can change, and it has to change, and the key to it is going to be to say to local governments, you have abused your authority in terms of time, place, and manner restrictions. You no longer have that authority because you abused it, and you discriminated against people when you had it and we're taking it away from you. And that's what our Homeless Bill of Rights campaign is calling for. And this next last slide is just how you are more than welcome to get in touch with us. Um, on our website, because we work with so many organizations, we take serious that our website has to be current and up to date. Um, all of the things that I showed you or talked briefly about um, are in, on the website in more depth. Um, you're welcome to do some of the street outreach with us and, and we'll show you or we'll collate it for you and, and give you the information back for your communities and add it to the bigger picture. Um, and anybody that wants to work on creating a social justice movement um, is invited to join our campaign. And I'll now kick it back to Tristia for questions. Thank you very much, Paul. And also thank you, Sarah, for your comments today. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience uh, that I would like to address briefly. But before we do, we have a couple of additional survey questions uh, that we would appreciate you answering. The first one should be popping up on your screen now. Are you likely to use the information you have learned today in your work? And I'll give you a few moments to respond. Excellent. I'm very happy to see those results. 
Let's give you just a couple more moments here to finish responding to that. And we have one additional question that we'll ask you now. If you think that you will use it, in what ways might you use the information you learn today in your work? And we have a couple of options there that we thought would probably capture the majority of ways that our audience members might use some of the information about homeless bills rights learned today. While you're filling that out, I will address one question that was asked a couple of times by audience members, and that is, where can I find copies of bill language? That's a great question. In the report from, rights to, from Wrongs to Rights, in the appendix, we have information uh, and citations to each of the proposed and enacted bills. And for the enacted bills, we have actual copies of the legislative language. So you'll have that available for you. Uh, we also have that for uh, the proposed legislation. Now, because these laws are gaining in momentum, there are changes to the proposed bills all the time, or proposed bills will no longer be the versions that uh, are being advocated for because they were proposed in a prior legislative session. Uh, and California is an example of that. But there is information there. Also, we will be posting links to copies of the proposed legislation and enacted legislation on our website. Again, that's www.nlchp.org, where you'll be able to find our report. Links, uh, once we're able to put them up, to the legislative language that you all can use as models um, in your own community. We do have one final survey question that we'll be putting up on your screen now. As a result of this webinar, do you have a better understanding of homeless bills of rights? And we'll give you just a moment here to fill out that question. Great. Thank you very much for voting, and I'm very pleased with the results. Uh, since we have just a couple of moments left, uh, I will reserve answering some of the other questions that were asked live. Having said that, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will be providing those questions and written answers to those questions, again, available on the Law Center's website. I would encourage any of uh, the participants today to share this webinar. It was recorded, and we'll have that posted on our website with fellow advocates and other, uh, other associates of yours who might be interested in this information. And I would encourage you all to contact Tristia Bauman at the Law Center with any questions that you have about homeless bills of rights, uh, whether they be in general questions or whether you're seeking technical assistance on helping to enact those homeless bills of rights in your respective states. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And my contact information is included in the webinar. And of course, you can always find me on the Law Center's website. Thank you, everyone, my co-presenters, and also to the audience today for participating in this discussion about an exciting development in civil rights law. We hope to see many more of these bills pass across the United States. And we look forward to working with you on helping to make that reality. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon.